Good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to putting the eye in RSI. Um, my name is Kim Estes. I'm the senior instructional designer from um, Tarrant County College. And I'll let Lindsay, who's running the slides, go ahead and start us off. You're muted, Lindsay. Check out. All right, there. I'm sorry about that. Um, I am Lindsay Foster. I am an instructional designer specializing in accessibility at Tarrant County College Connect Campus, and um, I work with Kim. <laughs> Perfect. And actually, that's our second slide. If you want to advance us to that one, we can say hi. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so we'll, there we are. There's our titles. We're really excited to be here with you guys today to talk about regular and substantive interaction. Um, and I'm going to let Lindsay go over some of um, the uh, actual regulations that we'll be addressing today. Yes, so um, this is from the US um, Code of Federal Regulations. And we haven't listed all of the 34 CFR 600.2, but you can look at that for all of the pieces that relate to regular and substantive interaction. For the purposes of the definition of RSI, um, an instructor is an individual responsible for delivering course content and who meets the qualifications for instruction established by an institution's accrediting agency. So whatever institution that you have that is your accreditor, that would be the definition that you would use for a course instructor. Um, also for the purposes of the definition of RSI, substantive interaction is engaging students in teaching, learning and assessment consistent with the content under discussion and also at least two of the following items providing direct instruction, assessing or providing feedback on a student's coursework, providing information or responding to questions about the content of a course or a competency if you're doing CTE um, or um, career technology education classes, facilitating a group discussion regarding the content of a course or a competency, so facilitating a discussion board, for example, or any other institutional activity that are approved by the institution or the program's accrediting agency. So if it's something that your institution determines to be an educational activity or something that your accrediting agency determines to be an educational activity, it can also count toward RSI. And I really would like to point out that, um, especially on that slide, that it is all related to course content. Right. Um, we, there are lots of activities you can do with your students to engage that are not necessarily tied to course content. So RSI is really talking about that academic conversation that you have with your students um, in terms of their progress, their success and their mastery of the content in your course. Exactly. Great addition, Kim. Um, make sure that I'm, there you go. Um, so and finally, uh, an institution can ensure regular interaction between a student and an instructor or instructors, if you have co-instructors, like a lab course in science, for example, prior to the student's completion of a course or competency by providing an opportunity for substantive interactions with the student on a predictable and scheduled basis commensurate with the length of time and amount of course in the course or competency. So for example, if you have a 16 week course, the predictable and scheduled basis would be different. Um, it might be slightly less frequently than it would be in an eight week or a five week course, with both of which we offer here at TCC. Because if you're doing a compressed course format, you are obviously going to be interacting with students more on a daily basis. Whereas if you're on a 16 week semester, it might be on a weekly basis rather than daily basis. Absolutely. 
monitoring the student's academic engagement and success, and ensuring that an instructor is responsible for promptly and proactively engaging in substantive interaction with the student when needed on basis of such monitoring or upon request by the student. So this is the part of regular and substantive interaction that really discusses where the responsibility for the interaction lies. Primarily, it lies with the course instructor or it can be requested by the student, but the, the bulk of the responsibility lies with the course instructor rather than having the student request those interactions. Right, and I would like to point out and point, um, point uh, the very first point too, the regular and substantive has to be scheduled. So this isn't email me if you have a question or um, you know, um, I can jump on chat if you, if you contact me. This is regularly scheduled interaction that the students are aware of and know that they can participate in. And we're gonna break that down in the next couple of slides because a lot of that is really recent. Um, the, the Department of Education put the regular and substantive interaction um, qualifications or, or clarifications in in June, 2021 due to responses from um, universities and colleges that had been kind of dinged and, and had been uh, found lacking by the organization, but they argued that these were not clear. So what you're seeing here is a clarification from the Department of Education so that universities and colleges will know what exactly they're looking for for RSI. And in the next couple of slides, Lindsay's done an amazing job of breaking this down for you and showing you what this means really for your faculty what is their responsibility? What are some examples of how they can do this? And so um, let's go ahead and let's get started with some of those examples for you guys. All right, so one of the first things that you can do as an instructor or you, you as an institution can do for your instructors is to um, emphasize personalized specific feedback. Um, the instructor providing feedback that's both customized to the student and specific to the work. Um, Kim, do you want to talk about those three points? Um, absolutely. So feedback provides information to the student that they can use to understand where they're being successful and where they need improvement. So just a, a multiple choice question and you got it right isn't really specific feedback. Anyone can get that. It doesn't explain to them why their answer was right, why their answer was wrong, or give them suggestions for um, rereading materials. So really the, that feedback needs to be personalized to the student. Um, it can be a rubric. Rubrics are used to grade and facilitate constructive feedback in key areas. If I am a student and you've graded my paper on a rubric and you mark on the rubric in my LMS or tell me which part of the rubric I got and your rubric is descriptive, then I know exactly what I have and what I'm missing. So a rubric also fills this requirement. Feedback may include instruction, participation in discussion boards, tutorial sessions that are offered and recorded for later access that offer the students the ability to chat. That's the big thing. I cannot hold a tutorial where all I do is teach and they don't get to communicate. They need to be able to chat, ask questions, turn on their microphones. That interaction piece is big. If it's just a recording of me explaining something, that is not qualified for RSI. Um, instructor comments on essays or annotations and assignments. Feedback may also include recorded audio or video commentary on assignments. A lot of us use an LMS. We are an online campus. We use Instructure's Canvas LMS, and we have the ability to do audio and video recorded comments on any assignment. Um, we have the ability to annotate. We also have the ability to add rubrics to assignments. Um, and another thing that we can do, which is really great, is um, uh, that feedback coming in. We have quiz uh, options for those multiple choice quizzes that when they choose a wrong answer, um, we can customize the feedback to explain why that answer is wrong. When they choose the correct answer, we can give feedback to say, yes, you're right. As in chapter two of the biology text in photosynthesis, this action occurs. So that is actually qualified for RSI because it is personalized feedback based on the answer that the individual student chooses. What I can't do is say, here's a multiple choice quiz. Go ahead and take it. Your, your, your feedback is your grade. A grade is not feedback. We need to be talking to our students about the mastery of content, giving them that feedback. LMSs are great for this because a lot of them include comment banks. Um, and I can speak for Canvas. Uh, it has a comment bank. So if I am giving constant feedback on essays, I'm an English teacher. So if my students are constantly missing a grammar or, or mechanics issue, if their, miss, their thesis statement is missing because they have not backed it up with research, I can actually load those comments and then choose which student gets those comments based on their work. That is individualized feedback. While I'm still using a canned comment that I've pre-written, I may not give that to every student. It's going to depend on the quality of their work. So that feedback has to be individualized by the instructor. 
Okay. Addition additionally, the feedback has to be frequent and timely. Um, instructors need to provide feedback that occurs often and on a regular basis. This goes back to that point about regular, predictable, and scheduled. Um, Kim, you want to talk about those sub points as well? Sure. Absolutely. Um, and I, I'm just going to throw this out here because I was just talking about this with a faculty member yesterday. Um, giving someone their grades at the end of the semester is not good feedback. <laughs> they need to be getting regularly scheduled feedback all along the way, right? Grading needs to happen. Feedback needs to happen. Um, feedback needs to be given with sufficient time and frequency so that students can correct their misunderstandings and deepen their understanding of that course content so they can demonstrate mastery. If I never give you any feedback until I grade everything the last week of the course, you don't know what you got wrong in the first two weeks of the course to fix it for the third, fourth, fifth, sixth weeks. Um, instructors consistently and regularly need to respond to student questions during the expected stated time, as in office hours, or um, they need to frame or communicate in advance as possible when delays would be expected. We just had an ice storm in Texas, and I know that the weather there in, in uh, San Juan is beautiful today. My president um, did a video chat with me. He's there at the conference. I'm very jealous and wish I were there at the conference, but um, I need to, we need to be able to, in advance, let students know when there's going to be a breakdown in that communication. And then we need to make an effort to communicate with struggling or absentee students who are likely to benefit from early intervention. A lot of um, LMSs have features mixed in where you can email a specified group of students. So um, for example, in Canvas, I can go to my gradebook on an assignment and I can tell it to send a message to every student who has not yet submitted or every student who possibly um, scored a failing grade on that assignment to reach out to them, to communicate with them. I am actively proactively contacting my students who are struggling and letting them know what resources are available. I have office hours, I have tutorials. Hey, here's an extra article I saw you were struggling. Um, I see you have not been in class, are you okay? Do you need some additional help? Is there something I can do for you? That kind of interaction has to take place and it has to be regular and it has to instigate from the instructor. And I would add to that, um, when you're talking about sufficient time and frequency, many institutions have policies regarding um, the amount of time that elapses when a student asks a question or it turns in an assignment and an instructor responds to that. Here at TCC, um, at Connect Campus, it's typically that the feedback has to be provided on an assignment within a week of submission so that it's not at the end of the semester, at the end of the term or waiting into the midterm and the student has no idea where they stand in the class. So make sure that if you don't have those kinds of policies in your faculty handbook available, make sure that you put in a policy about expectation of responding for email, um, on assignments, those kinds of things so that students know when they can expect to receive a response. Absolutely. It's very difficult for faculty to meet that goal if those expectations are not in their faculty guide. And, and here at Connect, we have a faculty guide that not only tells our faculty how many office hours they have to have, um, and, and we are a virtual campus, so those are virtual office hours, but it also tells them how quickly they should respond to email and um, in their grading policy when they're going to communicate that, that information to their students. So that it needs to be written into your faculty guide if you don't already have that. It's difficult for instructors to, to follow along if we don't do that. So on this slide, we've just put together, this is a, um, a checklist and I use that term loosely because it should not be a, yes, I did it so I can check this off. Therefore, I have met RSI. This is more of a checklist of, do I do this? Could I add this to my course or suggestions um, on ideas on ways that you can provide feedback um, mm -hmm. and different tools that you can use to provide feedback. I'll go over the top row and Kim's gonna do the middle and the bottom. Um, so you can use your syllabus to help you support RSI by defining the response time for students on questions and assignments, which is what Kim and I just talked about. You can use your discussion boards to respond to students and interact with students um, on their discussion board threads. Don't just post the assignment, but as students respond to those assignments, go in and find common threads or commonly asked questions. Um, you can also participate in discussion boards by correcting errors or um, facts that maybe aren't correct, or you can add additional expertise or real world connections to yeah. those responses students have come up with. 
Absolutely. I can't, I can't stress more uh, enough that when you're working in discussion boards, a lot of faculty tell me, but I'm trying to stay out of the discussion boards. I want my students talking to each other. But honestly, you're the content area expert, right? The subject matter expert. You want to make sure you're guiding them towards an understanding of your content that is relevant, that is, that is correct, that, that is supported by the research and the facts in your content area, moving them in, um, in a way that helps them to master those learning objectives. So you're going to want to participate. Regular and substantive interaction requires that faculty member to get into the discussion forum and participate and give context to the learning that's happening, just like Lindy said. Um, you do want to ask students for feedback about your course on a regular basis. And I know that a lot of institutions have a um, they have a, a survey that they send out, an end of course survey, and students fill it out and then they gather that data. But we're talking about the individual instructor asking students for feedback at the beginning, asking students, you know, what's your, what's your work style look like? Do you work more in the mornings, the afternoons, the evenings? Are you working a job? You know, what's your workload? What is your plate? Is your plate full? And using that information to adjust course due dates and timing to, to better suit the students that are currently in the class. Then putting something out in the middle of the course. Hey, we're halfway through the course. How are you doing? Are you finding the pacing okay? Are you understanding the content? Have you been able to attend a tutorial session or an office hours? Have you needed help? Um, especially asking struggling students, you know, I noticed you're not, if you're not in class a lot, what are some of the barriers for getting into class and working with us if you work virtually? Um, you want to revise or update course content based on that. And then, of course, at the end of the course, asking them how they feel. What did you learn? Do you feel like the, the, um, the information in the syllabus was addressed in our course? What did you like about my course? And what can I do to make my course better? And a lot of faculty avoid this like the plague because it's very difficult to gather that information about yourself, right? We are all subject matter experts. We love our topics. We want to talk about it. And it's hard to hear that perhaps we're not conveying it in a way that works for students. But that's exactly what we need to do for regular and substantive interaction. We need to reach out to our end users and talk to them, our students, our clients, our, you know, um, our responsibility, and then take that responsibility back to our course and make that work. Um, you can, um, again, uh, use existing feedback tools to redirect or support students learning and assessments. I spoke about the quiz feedback, redirecting them to content. When you see a student struggling, providing additional resources and having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with that student, either face-to-face -face or vi virtually, to provide them with additional resources. Reaching out to that student when you recognize a misconception or a lack of skills and providing them resources to build that back up or correct that misconception is part of RSI. It's also part of best practices for teaching, right? A lot of RSI you're going to find is practical application of best practices in teaching and learning. Um, you can also respond to discussion. Oh, I didn't do the bottom row. Sorry. Discussion board threads by commenting on common topics, which we covered, um, providing that feedback, and then summarizing student responses. Um, a lot of uh, we have a faculty member who goes back in and she chooses one student response, and she will um, she will summarize that to the rest of the class, and then talk about it. Uh, she does a brief video, puts it in the announcements, and then they get an announcement about the discussion once it's graded. And she says, you know, I was reading Michael's uh, contribution, and here's something that I found that really applies to what we're studying. And, and so she pulls that out and breaks that down and gives context. So that's another way to wake that work with the discussion board. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you jump. Um, no, no, so we're going to really talk, we're going to also talk about instructor presence because this is another piece of RSI where the instructor demonstrates a strong, engaging presence by taking an active role in the course. The key word here is active and another key word is role. Um, you need to be active. The difference between a correspondence course and a distance learning course is that if a student could enter your course, start at the beginning of the semester, go completely through the course without engaging basically with the instructor at all, like read the material, take the quizzes and finish the course, write the papers, um, that would be a correspondence course. It really is no different than writing it on a piece of paper, sticking it in an envelope and sending it through the mail. A distance learning course requires interaction and interplay as we've already addressed between the instructor and the students. So right. Kim is gonna talk about these three points and, and expand on that. And I do wanna point out, and, and, and I don't wanna be a Debbie Downer and, and add anything that feels like threatening to this, but the difference between distance learning and a correspondence course is the Department of Education rescinding your financial aid for correspondence courses. So if you have students in online courses and you're dealing with RSI and you're found audited by your accrediting agency and found to be not in compliance, 
the consequence of that is a rescind. They will rescind the, the financial aid. You'll have to pay back the financial aid for those courses. So we want to make sure our instructors are aware that this helps with funding for students so that they can take these courses and advance in their careers and in their, their academic and their career path. So we want to make sure that we're meeting these, um, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's also a compliance issue in order to, to obtain financial aid for our institutions. Um, so the instructor needs to post regular and consistently pre predictable announcements, add course materials and resources, respond to questions, guide the discussion boards, provide feedback in meaningful and engaging ways with students to establish a presence in the course. You need to be physically and virtually present in your courses for this. You cannot disappear and say, just read the syllabus, just read the chapter and take the quiz. You need to be engaged. I mean, the purpose of the instructor is to help our students to put all of this information into context and to make connections, right? So that experience from that SME is very, that subject matter expert is very important. You want to write in the first uh, person where appropriate to establish your voice in the course material. Students need to get an, a sense of who you are as a scientist, as an English professor, as a writer, uh, you know, as a researcher, you know. So we want to make sure that we put some of ourselves in that class and be a present, present person. When, when we work virtually a lot, we lose some of that ability. You know, if we, if we come to a classroom and you get to know my, my cheesy 1980s jokes, I, I do a lot of those, right? But if I don't bring that back into my virtual classroom, they miss out on, on getting to know me as a human being, getting to feel my passion for my subject matter area, and, and really being able to connect to me in that way. Um, students should see evidence of instructor activity at multiple points throughout the week in the course. They should be getting emails or, or direct messages from you. They should see you in the, in, in the discussion boards, um, in the announcements, um, getting to know you and your personality and how you apply your knowledge in this content area in the real world. So that's really and, important for students to connect. And to just add on to what Kim was saying, um, if you are thinking about a face-to-face course and moving to a distance learning course. In a face-to-face -face course, you walk in, you stand maybe at the front of the room, you pull up your, your presentation deck for your lecture, and you stand in front of the class and you lecture. You do not say to students, a, a lecture room of 300 students, okay, I'm going to pull up the lecture slides and everyone is just going to read them while I click through them or I'm going to send them to your computers and you just read them while I stand here. You lecture, students raise their hands and they ask questions. This is the same kind of environment that we're trying to create in this virtual opportunity through instructor presence. So we're gonna jump ahead and, and talk about some ways that you can do that with this RSI checklist. Again, this is not meant to be a list of, yes, I did this, so I have I can check it off and say that I'm done with RSI for my course. This is more of a list of suggested things that will qualify activities if you need to make suggestions to your faculty. So I'll let Kim kick this off. Thanks. So we spoke about creating announcements and using announcement features in, in your online learning platform. Um, announcements are great and different ways to use them, not just the test is tomorrow, right? But also maybe including a summary of the previous week's work, learnings or topics. We have a, an economics teacher who every, every week puts up a topic that is hot in the news and explains how it's relevant to the economics that they're studying in their class. She, um, she does really quick check-ins with her students. She, there's SEL, which is social and emotional learning. There's checking in with your students to say, hey, we had an ice storm. I'm just checking in on you. Do you all have Wi-Fi? Is everyone okay? Were you able to work? Does anybody need anything? Again, that instructor presence, showing that you're there for your students and building those relationships can be done in that manner. Creating announcements that highlight student responses or corrects common misunderstandings like we spoke about before. You know, Mark's, Mark's discussion prompt really made me think about what we were talking about in the last chapter, and I wanted to show you that connection. Um, offering regular, scheduled, and predictable office hours. Not, here's my calendar, make an appointment, and I will talk to you. I am online and available to you, both in video and chat from 7, you know, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And it doesn't have to be video. We got a lot of our online instructors who are really anti-video. I was kind of surprised, like, oh, I don't want to have my face on. And, my, and Lindsay often asks them, so when you teach face-to-face -face classes, do you put a plastic bag over your head? 
or do they get to see you? Getting to know your quirks and your personality are part of that. Then they would get that in a regular classroom, a face-to-face classroom. So encouraging the video conferencing when you are doing your office hours. And what's really great about those regular and predicted office hours, it's just like if I were at a face-to-face campus and sitting in my office, I'm there working. If a student comes by, I stop what I'm doing and I assist that student. But when they're not there, I continue to work. You can do that in your virtual office hours as well. RSI states that you must offer them regularly, scheduled, and the students are aware of it and can access you. But if no student shows up, the, it still counts for your RSI because you were there and available and they were regularly scheduled. You're not going to have a student come to your office, well, maybe you will, every single day at the same time all the time, right? It's going to fluctuate. So it's as long as the office hours are what is consistent and you are available to students, that's what counts for RSI. They may not avail themselves of that opportunity, but the opportunity must be available. Okay, Lynn, you wanna grab the others? So you can also, um, if you have students who don't attend your office hours, and we have faculty members who have renamed them tutorials or um, study hall so that students know that it's an opportunity to ask questions, you can record those opportunities where students ask questions and post it for students who maybe couldn't attend because of their schedule that day. You, again, can offer uh, video conferencing synchronous sessions where students get a chance to offer questions or do tutorials or study halls. You can create lectures or podcasts that address the course content and the topics, allowing, again, for that student interaction. There's that student that's back and forth again. Communicate with students who may be at risk and reach out to them. In our Canvas installation, we have the ability to message students directly. Um, You could also use those announcements things as tools, as Kim mentioned previously, that would be another way to do that. We've already talked a little bit about rubrics and offering specific feedback and giving those real world examples through announcements or discussion boards and sharing how to connect that learning. Um, And this is just a really quick glance at how you might potentially schedule some activities so that you could plan for RSI week Mm -hmm. by week. You know, if you have a a 16 week, it might look slightly different than this, but notice that the planning and the scheduling are initiated at the point of the instructor and they allow for those opportunities for student interaction while offering the equity of recorded opportunities for students who maybe need to view that asynchronously. And I know we're running short on time, so. Yes, so we'll get through this quickly. I just do want to say, if you are someone who works with faculty, providing them examples like this, and you're welcome to take the the examples off this slide, is really important um, so that they can feel comfortable knowing that, okay, I'm not really sure what to do. Here are some ideas to get them started. And we find that our faculty then start getting engaged and they start coming up with their own activities as they get more comfortable in this role. Absolutely. So that's what we have to share. Are there any questions for us? While we're waiting to see if there are any questions, I do wanna offer um, one of the ways our department instructional design helps our faculty, our online faculty with RSI. We have offered a, um, a two hour course and it's an in-depth course that they can take and then receive a, a digital badge for, for completing that says that they've been through RSI and they actually, it's a, it's a hands-on participatory course where they create things so that they are comfortable creating in this environment where they're thinking about that regular and substantive interaction. We also have um, a resource plot that are our resource hub that our faculty can go to. And we have an entire module on RSI with examples, with suggestions. We created a PDF um, introduction to RSI booklet for our faculty that was sent out to all of our faculty when we introduced the concept of RSI um, back in 2021 in June when this came out. Um, So really providing those resources and having a place to, to house them so that faculty can come back and revisit them. But also, it's really great. We have e-faculty coaching in our district. And our e-faculty coaches go in and observe our instructors. They make recommendations. They give them feedback based on a rubric. And RSI is one of the items that we look at when our faculty e-faculty coaches go into a classroom. And they work with our instructors to help beef that up if it's something that is missing in the course. So it's not only about um, having your faculty do it, but it's also great when I think Kim froze. Mm-hmm. Must be cold where she is. <laughs> it is cold where we are. Yes. 
And this is Paul Sale from uh, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. I'm wondering if you see any language in any of the accrediting bodies, um, audit checklists, has it made it to those yet? Or how, um, how, what material must we provide? So part of my position is to monitor those uh, various things that are going on in the legislature. I have not yet seen a checklist specific. Uh, there are several institutions that have created their own resources. And we have some, if you need to need some to share, that make, suge make suggested activities for those who are looking for things that you can connect similar to what we shared today. Um, literally, we have an Excel sheet. We have um, a Canvas uh, cartridge that we can share with you. But I have not seen anything from the Department of Education that's been issued that's official. Um, you might ask your accrediting agency, ours is SAC COC, um, but you might ask your accrediting agency, particularly if you're in an accreditation year, uh, because that will be something that they're looking for. And they are one of the triggers that can cause an audit of your of your courses. I would just say, particularly here at TCC, one of the things that we've done is the federal government requires two of the five interactions. TCC has added an additional third requirement for our faculty. So we're, we're making that step above and beyond so that we make sure that we meet those things um, and we are not found to be out of compliance. Thank you. You're welcome. And Mandy, I see that you're interested in the Canvas cartridge. If you just send us an email, we'll be happy to share that with you. There's 